الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين we have been covering the topic of people in the Qur'an. How does the Qur'an talk about people as communities, as clusters of humans, as societies, and as nations? We spoke about man in the Qur'an as an individual, as a behavior, as a creature, as what his nature is. And when we started to talk about and Nas in the Quran, the people in the Quran, we found a striking classification by the Quran in which the Quran classifies people into three basic groups. Actually, two. Then one would stem out of the third. So the Quran divides people into the believers and the disbelievers. Among the disbelievers comes a subset which is called Al-Munafiqoon, right? Last time we covered the believers as to how the Quran describes them. And today we are going to cover Al-Kafirun and also we are going to cover some of what we could of the hypocrites and their description and their position. This classification means two things. Number one, Allah wants you to know who's out there around you so that you treat each accordingly. And he doesn't identify them by names, but by their behavior. In other words, the Quran is teaching us that when we judge people, we judge them based on behavior, not based on liking or not liking, love or hate, not these categories. It is about being objective. So you judge a person by their behavior. What matters most for every human being is what they do. Definitely, before that, it matters what they believe. Why? Not because Allah wants to us to be divided by what we believe only, but because belief, as we explained last time, influences your ideas, your expectations, your wants, your desires, and it influences definitely your behavior. So looking at the person's faith has to consider their behavior. Looking at the person's behavior has to consider their faith so that you know what this behavior, what is this behavior motivated by. So we are all motivated by our faith Sometimes we are motivated by our needs. If you're hungry, hunger gives you a motive to seek food. If you're thirsty, you seek water. So the behavior comes as a subset of your feeling or your thoughts and your ideas and your faith. So also in classifying people into these three categories or two and a subset of the munafiqeen, it also gives each individual of us, whether you believe or you don't believe, you are given a choice as to which group you want to be with. So, in the description of the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us at the end of the description, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Those are the successful ones. So if you want to succeed, if you want to win with Allah, your way is to go with the believers. Then when it talks about the disbelievers, it says, وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ 
they have a grave torment awaiting for them. So Allah gives you the description, the behavior, what they do, each set, and then it tells you where they are heading so that your choice is not only a choice of temporarily benefit or uh, interest, but it has to be based on your wanting of the destiny that this group is heading to. Their destiny is what matters to you. So if you want to belong to the believers, you have a choice. If anyone wants to belong to the disbelievers, he has a choice. And those choices are protected in Islam. You cannot coerce any person to change their faith. You cannot coerce or force anybody to change their faith based on what you want. Even if you have the power to. You have to protect everybody's rights. So those choices are offered to everyone who receives the Quran, who reads the message to belong somewhere. There is no fourth option. Actually, the Quran makes them only two. The, the subset is only a subset, which means al munafiqun are kafirun, but they belong to a subset of category, which is the hypocrites. But they are originally kafirun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, huwa alladhi khalaqakum. It is he who has created you. فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرٌ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنٌ Some of you believe and some of you don't believe. So these are the only two real categories, original categories, besides the subset of the hypocrites. So we understand now that the reason the Quran starts off in the beginning of chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, with these classifications and these descriptions is to lay down all the choices we have as humans. One day, uh, what's his name? Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum turned to the Prophet ﷺ after the prayer. And he asked him, he said, I hear you and I hear Mu'adh humming some words that I don't really understand. What do you say after the prayer? So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, what do you do? What do you say? He said, I say, oh Allah, I ask you for paradise and I ask you to save me from hellfire. He said, this is all of our humming is about. All of what we're saying is rotating around the same thing. Okay? In this hadith, the Prophet teaches us that your words, your choice of words for dua, are as good as the choice of the words of the Prophet, so long as you are sincere, you don't ask Allah to give you something that is haram or that leads to haram. Okay? So, what is the relevance of this hadith to what we're talking about? The relevance is the rest of the Quran is rotating and revolving around these three classifications. If you understand those three classifications, and you can identify yourself on the spiritual map with Allah, where you belong. And if you find your behavior putting you where you don't want to be, then you have a chance to correct. You have a chance to correct. If you want to secure a better destiny, you have a chance. And the chance is your life. But because we don't secure tomorrow or even the rest of the day, we have to correct immediately as soon as I discover that I am heading in the wrong direction, I have to correct. It is like driving on a highway and you discover that you're running north instead of south. What do you do? Take the first exit and make a U-turn. So the ultimate purpose of the entirety of the Quran is to highlight more description of the believers, more description of the kafirin, more description of the munafiqeen and their behavior so that we know them and so that <coughs> excuse me and so that we do not make choices here and we don't like the destiny where they lead us to so if you if you like a choice you better like the end result of that choice so the kafirin as described here in the quran and we explained before that the kafir is someone who has been presented with the message and given an opportunity to choose 
and he chose to disbelieve. Full message, full representation, full vocabulary, full understanding, and then he decided not to accept. That is a typical disbeliever. But there is another category, the unbeliever, the one who has never heard of Islam and has never been presented with Islam as it should be. That's an unbeliever, someone who grew up in disbelief. He grew up in the wrong uh, belief system, in the wrong lifestyle, and he doesn't know any better. That is unbeliever. So we have to be very careful when we talk with non-Muslims that we be clear when we say disbeliever, we have to distinguish between someone who has been presented with the message and decided to reject it on basis of knowledge and clear understanding and someone who has never been presented with the full message and the complete mission of what it means to be a Muslim. So here it says, Inna ladina kafaru, those who have disbelieved, it is the same for them, whether you warn them or you don't warn them. When someone decides on clear knowledge to reject the message flat out, then the Quran is saying this kind of rejection, whether you warn them, O Muhammad, وسلم, or you don't warn them, they are not going to believe. Why? They already made a choice based on clear knowledge and full knowledge. But someone who has heard negative stuff about Islam and he has only held Islam in negative black dark picture that is not someone who has heard about Islam he has heard misinformation about Islam and there's a big difference so we have to be careful that we do not classify people wrongly and apply the uh, the consequences of how to deal with them someone who is an unbeliever our role with him is to guide them to communicate with them to help them understand to give them an opportunity to discover the beauty of the message and the beauty of this faith. But how could we do this if we don't talk to them? So if you boycott somebody because just he is an unbeliever, he doesn't know any better, then the mistake is yours and his right to learn is your responsibility and he will ask it of you on the day of judgment before Allah. So neighbors and classmates and colleagues in the work and anybody that comes across our way that we have a chance to explain Islam to, if we don't, he will ask it of us on the Day of Judgment. He will say, Oh Allah, they ate the food I planted. They wore the clothing we manufactured. They rode the cars we made. But when it comes to faith, they gave us their back. And when they needed us, they came crying to us. What a position. What a position to be in in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to take our da'wah and our mission seriously. And we have to know who should receive our message. So it is the same for them whether you warn them or you don't warn them. Because the warning has a condition. إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرِ إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرِ وَخَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ So the inzar, the warning, is only to be delivered to the believers. So when you see somebody doing something wrong, you should understand what your role is. You don't judge an unbeliever or a disbeliever based on your believer criteria. Because his subject is totally different. It is not about their behavior, it's about their faith. Because faith guides behavior. Faith controls behavior. Okay? So if someone is not believing, then you don't talk to them about the details of faith. Oh, khamr is haram. Gambling is haram. Homosexuality is haram. But he doesn't believe in the principle of haram that you're referring to. So primarily, you have to invite them to Islam. You have to invite them to Islam first. Then we talk about behavior. Some of us, unfortunately, when a sister comes here who is not a Muslim, the first thing is hijab. Well, it doesn't make sense. The first thing should be her faith. The first thing should be 
that she owns to the faith before we ask of her to dress nicely and to dress properly. Okay? وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ If an unbeliever in the battlefield who was fighting you <coughs> seeks your protection, then give him protection until he hears the whole message. And then deliver him to a safe place out of the battlefield. ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَةً Take him out of the fight so that he can think clearly. So you cannot invite somebody in the heat of a fight. You cannot invite somebody in the heat of a clash. That is not the atmosphere. The atmosphere should be always peace. And that's why Islam emphasizes peace before, during, and after you deliver the message. And this is how a Muslim should always project himself as a peacemaker not a war monger. So those who disbelieved, it's the same for them, whether you warn them or you don't, didn't warn them. What happens to them? When they reject, there, see, there are seals that are set on their hearts. On their hearing, it will also be sealed. Their eyes will be covered. Does a person see when his eyes are covered? No, they don't. Would a person hear when there's a seal on their ears? No. Could a person reflect and think and reason when their heart is sealed? No. So your first mission is to alifu qalbah, to win over his heart. Then you deliver the message to an open heart. But when the heart is full of hatred, when the heart is full of animosity and attacks, this is not the moment for delivering a message to a sealed heart, a sealed uh, hearing, or a covered eye. Then the end result is, وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ They are going to be subjected to grave torment on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this. The most dangerous category is this one, the hypocrites. And the Quran does not leave a space between the disbelievers and the hypocrites because they are a subset, as we mentioned before. The hypocrites, they cover their unbelief when they are with the believers, uh, when they are with the disbelievers. They cover, no, when they are with the believers, they cover disbelief. And when they are with the uh, disbelievers, they are totally against the believers. And this is what this set of ayat will tell us. Some of the people are ones who say, we believed in Allah and we believed in the Day of Judgment. But in truth, they have never believed. They are not believers then what are they doing? They are trying to deceive Allah and the believers, but in reality, they deceive none but themselves. They deceive none but themselves. And they do not even feel it. It is not that they are excused because they don't feel it, because the action speaks for itself. If someone comes to say, I am a believer, and in reality, they do not and never believed. And they go behind your back and mock your faith. And mock your belief. And mock your prayer. And mock your worship. And mock your fasting. And mock your book and your prophet and everything you stand for. How could you believe them? How could you believe them? So the, the good point in exposing this type of people is that the Qur'an gives us what is in their heart. We wouldn't have known on our own that somebody is playing both sides. He comes to the believers, he wants the benefit and the protection from the believers. And at the same time, he wants the benefit and the protection of the disbelievers. Nobody would be uncovered unless Allah 
removes their cover. We wouldn't know if Allah didn't tell us. Okay? So they try to deceive or they think that they are deceiving Allah and the believers, but they deceive no one but themselves. And to them is the awaiting of the severe torment. Okay. What are they doing? These people have sickness in their heart. In their heart is a disease. What is the name of that disease? It is hypocrisy. So whenever you see someone wavering between the believers and the disbelievers, you have to take a step back. Take a step back and be careful. Because those people, as described in other places in the Quran, لا إله هؤلاء ولا إله هؤلاء They want just to go after what they perceive as their interest. But their interest is to believe. But they have another interest, which is material interest. So if the believers give them money, give them support, give them zakah, right? They come, they fast, and they pray with us. And if the disbelievers are going to give them security, they are going to give them something different or other better resources, they will go work for them, and yet they will keep a place here. So they want to have one foot in here and what foot, one foot over there. So what are they looking for? They are looking for benefits wherever they are. Perceived benefits, not real benefits. When you limit your benefit to material benefit, it is not real benefit. When you perceive your benefit as limited benefits that you may get on this earth, but they have no bearing on your uh, destiny in the hereafter, you are losing both. خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينَ you miss and lose this life and the hereafter together. So Allah describes them as people who have disease in their heart. The disease is hypocrisy. And they have severe torment because of the lies they used to make. So they go to the believers and say, we believe, we are with you. Alam nakun ma'akum? Haven't we been with you? And they go to the, dis the disbelievers and say, haven't we uh, been with you? We have supported you. We gave you the secrets of the Muslims. We give you information about the Muslims, what they do, when they pray, when they open the mosque, when they close the mosque. We gave you those secrets, right? So they want, and their position changes with the situation. فَإِن كَانَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ نَصِيبٌ قَالُوا أَلَمْ نَكُمْ مَعَكُمْ haven't we been with you? And if the kafirin has the day, they say, haven't we been supporting you? So they have this kind of flip-flop position based on the conditions and the situation. And when and if they are told, do not spread corruption and mischief, do not instigate wars, do not entice people to fight each other and keep the bloodshed going on. Because the munafiqeen cannot benefit actually without corruption. It is only through corruption that they have an environment in which they can work. So if they cannot win your ears, if they cannot entice you to join them, at least they want to pick secrets from you to take it to the other side. Those munafiqeen are the ones who are most likely to work with the enemies. The enemies of your nation, the enemies of your faith, the enemies of your community, they are most likely to work and help them because the, either out of fear or looking for benefits, looking for protection, looking for money, looking for any benefits. And most of the people who work against their nation, their faith, their community, they fall in this category. They fall in this category. So when they are told, do not spread mischief and corruption on earth, they say, indeed, we are reformers. Can you imagine? They are the reformers. So who is spreading corruption? Who is spreading rumors? Who is spreading any windows? Who is scaring Muslims from the rest of the world? And who is scaring the rest of the world from Muslims? It is the hypocrites. Who is inviting everybody to fight against each other? It is the hypocrites. 
who is destroying the morale of the Muslim community so that they give up and they cave in? It is the hypocrites. It is this group. And this is why it is the most dangerous group. If someone makes a choice to be an unbeliever or disbeliever, he likes what he does, he doesn't want to listen to the message, it's a choice he has and it's a choice I would protect as a Muslim. But if someone wants to play on both sides and benefit from putting them at odds and wars, then this one is the one I want to cut out of my life. I don't want to have relationship with those hypocrites who come and try to infiltrate the, uh, the community for the sake of making some bucks or making some benefits for their individual selves. So they would say, we are only a reformer. We are only reformers. The Quran says, indeed, these are not the corrupt ones, but the corrupting ones. They corrupt the faith of the believer by throwing in your windows. So when somebody comes to tell you, listen, if you do this, they will go after you, they will get you, and I heard words that they are really after you, what are they looking for? They want to make you scared. They want to scare you. Don't believe them. Don't follow them. The believer fears none but Allah. But the hypocrites want the believers to fear the non-believers, right? And they go to the disbelievers or non-believers and they tell them, if you let Muslims grow, they will destroy you. They will change everything. They will change our lifestyle. They will take away our freedom because these guys, they hate freedoms. They hate liberty. And once I was in a discussion and I heard one of those Islamophobes talking and I said, so you want to, and the subject was Palestine. I said, you want to convince me that Palestinians hate freedoms? Whom are they occupying? <laughs> Whom did the Palestinians occupy? They are occupied themselves. So sometimes lopsided and upside down logic uh, reverses the role. So you are on the defensive and they are on the offensive. They have right and you only barely could push back. And as Muslims, we should reject all of that. All of this wrong logic, false uh, analogy, we should never accept it and take it seriously or discuss it. We should cut it off from the beginning. So the Quran says, Ala innahum humul mufsiduna, walakin la yashurun. They are the corrupting ones. They are the ones who are after corrupting the society on both sides, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. They want to see wars. They want to sell weapons. They want to market propaganda. They want to spread rumors. They want to see blood. That is what the hypocrites are looking for. Then they cash from both sides. The winner side, they will cash from them because they claim they belong. And when they are told, why don't you believe like those who have already believed, like the believers who came around the Prophet ﷺ, and they accepted faith. They say, do you want us to accept faith like these fools? Referring to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. You see, when somebody describes your community as fools, you know where they are heading, right? And the reason they use this description is they justify it for themselves because the followers of the Prophet ﷺ were the poor, the underprivileged, right? The exploited, the weak and the meek in the society. Those who have no status, right? And those are the typical followers of prophets. So these guys with their money and wealth and trade and business, they say, should you, should you, do you want us to be like these fools? No. So arrogance plays on their head and their heart, and they think they are in a better position. They are a class by themselves. So the rest, those believers, are the hip are the uh, the fools. So they say, "Qalu anu'minu kama aman al-sufaha." The Quran says, "Ala innahum hum al Indeed, they are the fools. So what is the definition of the Quran of a fool? A fool is someone 
who fools himself thinking he is fooling others. That's the definition of the fool. They think they are deceiving Allah and the believers, but in reality, they are only deceiving themselves. This is the real definition of the fool, not the poor, not the weak, not the underprivileged, not the exploited. These are not fools. The fools are the ones who make the wrong choice thinking they are on the right track. The fools are the ones who claim glory and their actions are shameful and miserable. But they do not know because they don't look in the mirror. They just look at themselves as a class and they look at the others who believe as lower class. They are stupid. These guys don't know what they are doing. Why are they doing this? What is this cruelty that they call hudud in Islam? What is this that they are doing to their women? They are fools. And when they meet the believers, that's a typical behavior. They say, we believed. And when they are alone with their own devils, which is most probably similar hypocrites or the disbelievers who encourage them and try to manipulate them and use them to get news about the Muslim community, right? So if they are alone with those devils, they say, we are with you. We are with you. We are here to support you. Again, it's those backward, you know, stupid fools. We are here for you. We are going to protect you against them. These people don't know what they are doing. And they say, and why do you go with them? No, no, no. We are only mocking them. We are there to get the news for you. That's all what we're doing. Allah says that he himself, and I want you to listen to this, Allah yastahzi'u bihim. When Allah does something and tells you that he is doing it, it means you don't have to compete with Allah. When he does it, he does it better than anyone. So you don't have to mock the disbelievers. We don't treat people tit for tat. They can and have the right that they think they have, right? In their head, they believe we are fools. That's the right to believe we are fools. But we don't have to do tit for tat and tell them, no, 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 you are the fools. We don't have. Allah is the one who is mocking them. And his mocking will creep into their life without them feeling it. They don't feel it and they don't know where they are being hit from. Allah mocks them and he would extend them or push them into their tyranny. Their tyranny is going to be getting a push. Because when Allah wants to condemn a community, he would pick the elite and give them control over that community, the corrupt elite that is, and the whole village. If they follow the elite, they will be destroyed. وَإِذَا أَرَدْنَا أَن نُهْلِكَ قَرْيَةً أَمَرْنَا مُطْرَفِيهَا In other uh, recitation, it says, أَمَّرْنَا مُطْرَفِيهَا Those well-to-do, those who are very wealthy and very powerful, they will get control. This is a sign that Allah has this nation in the crosshair of history. They are not going to last long unless they change course. But this is not for us. We are not destructive communities. We don't destroy anything that anybody builds. We don't. What we do is to do what we are commanded to do, to share with others the blessings and the light of Islam. And if they do not accept it, it's a choice we have to protect and let Allah take care of them. This is the position of Islam and Muslims. Let Allah take care of them. If they attack you physically, then you push back as much as you can in self-defense, as an individual or as a community or as a nation. Allah mocks them and he extends for them so that they increase in tyranny and they go about it blind. They go about it blind. You know when somebody is lashing out, 
a nation is lashing against another nation, they don't win much. Even if they win the battlefield, even if they control the land, but the people in the land will never accept them. There are nations who have been occupied or were occupied for hundreds of years. But then the history is in the hands of Allah. He would turn it any time he wants. And Allah is telling us this, that he is turning the days between people and recycling them between nations so that we do not get desperate and we do not act desperately. The Muslim should always act wisely based on knowledge and wisdom. Then those are the ones, the Quran says, who have purchased misguidance for guidance. Their business have never made any profit and they are never guided. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that everything is a business. They have their business and they have their eyes on what they perceive as their prophets. We also have a business with Allah. Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. Allah has purchased from the believers their souls and their wealth in return for paradise. It's a business, it's a good business. They have their business. They are taking the risk of being caught by the believers and the risk of being hated by the disbelievers for the perceived profits they want to make. And Allah says, they can never win. Their business never made profit and they were never guided. May Allah guide us to the straight path. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد Brothers and sisters Maybe some of you are saying So what? We, we know this subject Everybody knows who the believer Who is a disbeliever Who is a hypocrite We know all of that So what is the point? The point is فذكر in nafa'at al-dhikra the point is that we should know the details of the descriptions of the quran of the choices we are presented with in the quran so somebody would say i already made a choice i'm praying i'm here on friday so i know my choice yeah fine if you reach that degree of certainty then it is for you to know who is around you what their tactics are and your responsibility towards the disbeliever, the unbeliever, and the hypocrite. Because if you just know your faith and try to live it out, then what do you do then with others who don't share your faith? There is a responsibility. So you need to identify them and you need to protect those who ought to be protected and push back against those who want to destroy your community. So living your faith on your own is enough as a matter of spiritual responsibility. But the rest of the spiritual responsibility is to live that faith where you are. So if you are living in a Muslim society, then you have responsibilities. If you're living in a non-Muslim society, you have more responsibility towards the people that you live with. So we need to recognize this. This is the purpose of this. So this is something that we always have to keep our eyes on. The rest of the Quran is going to give us details of our responsibility in this life. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wasrif anna sharra ma qadayt, Allahumma qina wasrif anna sharra ma qadayt, Allahumma la tada' lana fi yawmina hadha dhamban illa ghafartah, wa la daynan illa qadaytah, wa la maridan illa shafaytah, ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته اللهم ارحم أمواتنا وأموات المسلمين اللهم ارحم أمواتنا وأموات المسلمين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين 
أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة